Hi there, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm the host of Montessori Creativity and the Meaning of Life. Today I want to start with a segment from the book Crushing, God Turns Pressure into Power by T.D. Jakes. The seed doesn't understand the vine that it's becoming. He says, out of all my years of teaching, preaching, mentoring, and living through hellish ordeals, I believe that our maturation requires that we be constricted to God's methods and imprisoned by his purpose. You see, I had the privilege of meeting some of the most interesting people in the world, and no one was more surprised than I was. In my wildest dreams, I never imagined sitting across from the CEO of AT&T or getting to see Oprah Winfrey move and operate in the worlds of film, television, and print media because the seed of who I was could not comprehend the fruit I could bear and the wine I would become. I didn't suddenly wake up as the person you see today. I was developed into this, and God is still fostering even more within me. None of what you see in my life today happened because of magic, luck, or happenstance. All of it is the fruit of purpose, cultivation, and time, the culmination of myriad random details coalescing into something beautiful. Let me illustrate what I mean. My wife, Sarita, and I never had any desire to do films. We started off preaching and doing gospel plays and nearly lost everything in our attempts to get them off the ground. Finally, we figured out how to be semi-successful with them and took the stage version of Woman Thou Art Loose to Atlanta. There, we happened to bump into Tyler Perry, but not the Tyler Perry you know of today. Each of us were seeds in the field of entertainment, and none of us really understood the power of what we were doing. We were just stumbling around trying to survive while we ministered the gospel in a unique way. Woman Thou Art Loose eventually made it to Los Angeles, and there we met Reuben Cannon, a film producer who helped introduce us to Hollywood. This was a project that my wife and I believed would make it no further than the stage, let alone to select television screens. All the while, it seemed as if we were haphazardly moving from one blessing, one moment, to the next. It was in the fields of preaching and entertainment that Sarita and I finally gained the slightest understanding that the Lord had planned for us, what the Lord had planned for us was far bigger, better, and brighter than what we had in mind. But that fruit wouldn't suddenly appear. The vine dresser would take us through a uniquely constructed process of cultivation that would lead to the development of the fruit you see today. Much like we did, you might find yourself stumbling from one season of your life to the next, wondering about the answer that would help you connect the dots that often seem so chaotic and disconnected. Having been displaced, dislocated, and dislodged from the comfortable environment you believed was best for you, you now find yourself stumbling around in circumstances and habitats that are completely alien to you. As you focus, your focus remains fixed on surviving the endless onslaughts of life. You miss what the master is doing with you and for you strategically developing you and escorting you from one stage of blessings to the next. To put it simply, the seed doesn't understand the vine that it's becoming. Everything that occurs in its life appears to be happenstance because all it can see is the muck and mire that it's trying to escape. It's when we are vines that we can look back at what we used to be and notice what appear to be accidents, incidents, and coincidences converge to produce what we are and the fruits that hang from our branches. Here's a quote by Stella Terrell Mann. To accept the responsibility of being a child of God is to accept the best that life has to offer you. I want to talk a little bit about waiting. And it's from a 
a book that I wrote back um, in 2009 called Your Creative Peace. Find and deepen your creative voice while communing with God. I am an in-a-hurry type of reader. Even when I am reading something that I have been waiting to dive into, I find that I'm rushing to the end, so fixated on the goal of finishing the book. But in order to refine and refresh and refuel, I need to take it in more deeply. Stop the shallow breathing. Reflect a little. Take it into the lab of my life and let the knowledge become the experience. Through the years, the Psalms have brought great comfort when no cliché or sympathetic word could penetrate the random, sudden plights of what I have found in my life. The psalmists have a knack for accessing the heart and the psyche. The soul gets soothed. The mind gets eased. The words are found. The lost find hope. The happy rejoice. The heart feels heard. The songs and laments connect the generations. The words bring community to the circumstance on a level of camaraderie that is unmatched by psychology and self-help seminars. The arts and music get at a situation almost sideways where tears and analyzing are not enough. Lecture and frustration can no longer lull us out of the space we find ourselves. The Psalms offer another way to render the emotions unnamed or under wraps, perhaps unconsciously. We navigate through the poems and words of these verses and then proceed to let it permeate our hearts. The structure is such that you could find lament in one psalm and in the very next psalm glorious rejoicing or vice versa. And life tends to follow that same structure ebbs and flows, rhythms and ripples, wave cascading emotions to the heights and the depths. The seasons of life and the eons of feelings push us forward or stop us cold. The mind's eye and soul work differently from rational intellectual dialogue. A random skimming of the Psalms can parse you through the highs and lows, peaks and valleys, all in one psalm many times. And the mind is reminded and the heart is softened by the one who renders the world as purely circumstantial, transitional, and temporary. Oftentimes the sorrow is so deep one could weep along with the psalmist lasting for a series of psalms, representing the sorrows of our own lives. Other times, the words lift you up like a kite into the clear blue skies of celebration, transcending any emotion you could describe simply with one word or two. One thing is for sure with the Psalms, if you rush to the end, you'll miss the point. The satisfaction is in the details of the very words and the multiple emotions. This is where life is found. Kim Rosen, in her book, Save by a Palm, talks about how we should work and move through a poem. She says, a poem is a physical event. The rhythm may quicken or slow your pulse. The flow of the language may expand your breathing. The music woven into the words may change the very texture of your voice. A poem even entrains your brain waves altering your biochemistry and allowing shifts in consciousness that can bring healing, understanding, and an unexpected insight. Spending time with a poem is a way of choosing what you're going to do with your attention. In this world of iPods, emails, cell phones, and spam, opportunities for fragmentation of consciousness are thick and fast. It can be life-saving to return to the sanctuary of a poem that you hold within you. Like singing a song you love or blasting it on the stereo, 
like reading a favorite psalm or the Heart Sutra several times a day. It is a choice to fill your thoughts with what you hold precious and believe in. Instead of the plethora of commercial jingles, self-criticisms, or anxieties about the past and the future that usually overrun the mind. When I focus on a poem that I love, my thoughts stop spinning and become quiet. My body relaxes. My breathing finds the rhythm of the poem. Whether I'm in the car or on the subway, walking on the beach or sitting on a meditation cushion, that poem becomes as real a refuge as any church, synagogue, or mosque. To develop a relationship with a poem is something like falling in love with all the wonder and challenge that it brings. It begins with fatuation, infatuation, the curiosity to get to know the poem, to learn everything you can about its meaning, rhythm, sound, and silence. At the same time, you're allowing the poem to carry you into yourself, evoking feelings, reflections, and new experiences of the world. Then, as with any relationship, inevitable difficulties arise and hard work comes. Suddenly, you find you don't like the last stanza after all, or you repeatedly stumble over the third line, or a certain turn of phrase inexplic inexplicably brings you up with a sense of self-discomfort you'd rather avoid. But you hang in there anyway, allowing the poem to take you beyond your comfort zone. And then a new and enriching experience invariably waits behind every resistance. Ultimately, there is a pleasure and grace that comes when the poem has, when the poem has become yours. You know it intimately and you share it with others, or you simply read it to yourself for your own pleasure. The spoken poem is a wondrous new creation, born of the unique convergence between words that have been written by someone else even someone who may have lived centuries ago in a faraway country, and your own voice. Thanks so much for stopping by. Make sure and subscribe to um, this podcast if this is something that is interesting for you. You can find me on at Robin underscore Norgren on Instagram, or you can also find me under UBU for life.